My name is Timothy Henshaw. I'm the head of hip hop and R&B at Amazon Music. Billboard put out the Executive of the Year article. The headline was, meet the man that helped turn Amazon Music into a global hip hop and R&B force. If you told me that as an 11 year old or 12 year old kid, I would have told you you were out your damn mind. I just never thought that like a kid from Compton could reach those goals. My conversation was always, I want to do great work that at least puts me in that conversation. Because if I don't get the credit, I'm a damn sure get the debit. I grew up on the west side of Compton, Grandy Avenue and 134th place. When my brother and I got to high school age, my mom just made a, a conscious decision to um, get a job at the school called Palisades High School, which was like 30 minutes away um, in a very, very rich neighborhood. And, you know, like her taking those sacrifices really changed my life. I was able to meet different people, uh, be introduced to different cultures. And it's, it's, it's probably one of the main reasons I'm sitting here today. I knew in my heart that I never wanted to go to college. Um, it just wasn't in the cards for me. But I knew I wanted to have better for myself. I knew I wanted to be in music. I just didn't understand how to get there. But like certain points when you come from where I come from, like that fear takes over um, and you start to overthink things. And so I graduated high school. My friends are going to these four year colleges, UCLA, USC. And I'm looking around like, damn, what, what you gonna do with your life? So for me, it was like, yo, I need to go join the Coast Guard because it was a way to get me out of my neighborhood. I could travel, I could create a better life for myself. The day I was going to sign my papers, my brother called me like, yo, come meet me um, at IHOP for breakfast. When I sat down at the table, he had tears in his eyes and he was like, man, we've had, we've had this dream to be in music our whole lives. He like, man, don't go, like, let's figure this out. We just started writing, getting in sessions, um, trying, to, trying to get placements with different artists. And we were able to land a, a placement called More with Usher and Red One. And that song took off. It was the NBA campaign song for that year. Wreck It Ralph. Um, got a lot of checks from Wreck It Ralph. That really sort of like solidified my brother and I in this business. It was like a blessing. It was kind of destiny. My brother Charles is one of the best voices in the world. He had this record called Make You Love Me. And through those sessions with Usher, we were able to meet this guy named Randy Phillips who was the CEO of AG Live at the time. I asked Randy for these Coachella passes and Jay-Z was the headliner at that Coachella, I think it was 2010. And so I took the passes and I got on Twitter and I'm like, yo, I'm gonna pick five people to give these passes to Tweet Power 106 to play this Make You Love Me record. And naturally like fans started to flood the radio station. And I got a call from Fuzzy Fan Savage. like, yo, turn on the radio. The record was playing on the on Power 106, Yes Ortiz played it on the new at two. And that just kind of gave us the, the fuel to keep going. For me, it was just like, yo, I didn't want to be riding my brother's coattail for the rest of my life. And not to say that I was, but like, I wanted to build my own name independent of him. For me, it was like, what was my stepping point to being an executive? There was a, a woman who hit me about a job at Vans. She said that they had needed help in hip hop and R&B, which is my bread and butter. The family culture that Vans provided for me um, was something that I needed in my early stages of becoming an executive. My first meeting at Vans was with Tyler, the creator. And Tyler walked in, there's a room full of white executives. And Tyler goes, he looks at me, he's like, yo! And his voice, y'all hired a nigga. <laughs> and you know, the room is like, he's looking, everybody's kind of looking uncomfortable. You know, these are like, all white people from Orange County. I knew exactly what he meant, but they didn't really understand. I felt like they just saw it was like, yo, this kid is cool. He's saying that this kid that we hired is really cool. We like this kid. <laughs> uh, we made a good hire. To me, what I took from that was like, Tyler was just kind of like putting a battery in my back to remain myself. I and mean, like for him to be that person and to come in and be like unapologetic about who we are, that gave me the ultimate confidence to walk in, and say what I needed to say and feel how I needed to feel and wear my Cuban chain. You know, if I wanted to wear a hoodie, like it just, it just gave me the battery to, in my back to, to be me. And I've carried that on through my whole career. So I stayed at Vans for two and a half years. When I felt like Vans was like reaching the ceiling for me, I didn't know what was next. Oftentimes, like my whole career, I've always just gotten the right calls at the right time. And I was sitting at my desk at Vans 
And this guy named Nate White was the director of uh, artist relations at Fender. He called me, he like, man, you need to come work for Fender. I'm like, Fender? He like, yeah, my bosses think the only black person that played guitar is Jimi Hendrix. This is a white dude, and I thought that shit was funny. Like, I thought it was hilarious, he made me laugh. And I took the meeting, and what I kind of like gathered from my research was like, Gibson was doing the work in, in um, the urban community and urban music, and Fender wasn't just by way of like not having a person there who had the relationships or, or the wherewithal to actually go do that. And so I took the job, and I was the first black artist relations executive at Fender. I started the urban music department at Fender, and from there we've done partnerships with her, Daniel Caesar, Steve Lacey, all of relationships that I helped cultivate and bring on the Fender. And now these people have their own like signature guitars to see like the different players that I was able to help um, and that the brand was able to help it was just like inspiring. And, and I feel really proud of like where the Fender program is today. And right around early 2018, I just started to feel like I had reached my ceiling. A woman named Christina Callio, who I met at Fender, reached out to me and was like, yo, my friend is hiring a position at Amazon Music for hip hop and r and I applied for the role, didn't hear anything. Then I applied for another role, didn't hear anything. I was talking to my wife about not ordering from Amazon anymore because they wouldn't give me a job. She was like, yo, you need to humble yourself. I heard that and it kind of like rocked me. Anything that I've ever wanted in my life, like I've always worked relentlessly to go get it. Her saying that in that moment, like, woke me up. So I'm sitting there and it's like, yo, what can I do to get these folks' attention and tell them, like, I'm the right person for the job? And so it just came in my head, like, yo, you should do, um, you should do video references with, like, artists, people that you call friends. So I called Kelly Clancy and Kelly and Chris, they're like my family. Like, I've never made a move in this business without consulting them. So they knew I wanted to be at Amazon. So I called Kelly first, like, look, I want to ask Malcolm to do this. She's like, yo, I'm headed to see him right now for the shoot. I'll call you later. She sends me this video of Malcolm playing the piano, and he turns to the camera and he goes, hey, Amazon, <laughs> if you have having second thoughts of hiring Tim, you should stop. And so the next video I got was from Scarface, and he was talking about how he had Amazon Prime, and then I got a video from Donald Glover, Anderson Pot, and I sent it to Amazon on a Friday. Friday goes by, I get no response. Saturday goes by, nothing Sunday. Monday, I'm like, man, what the hell is wrong with these people? <laughs> I woke up and I emailed them, and they're like, hey, like, we filled this role already. And I'm like, what? So I go about my business, I'm kind of upset. And the following day, I'm having lunch with a guy named Bill Bennett who used to be the CEO of uh, Nasra Warner, which is a good guy. And we're talking and I'm telling him about this video that I created for Amazon. And he's like, yo, let me see the video. I showed him the video and his mind is blown. And he's like, yo, I'm gonna send this to Dan McCarroll. And Dan McCarroll was the director of artist relations. It took him 15 minutes after he watched the video. And he's like, yo, you need to meet me at Culver City tomorrow. And it happened that fast. I was hired as the senior manager of artist relations because there was no hip hop team there. Right before me, a woman named Rochelle Balagun was hired to be the music curator. And then Sharon Baco was a younger woman in, based in Seattle. And we were just like the unofficial hip hop team at the time. We're creating a strategy um, to launch our global hip hop and R&B brand. And rotation just felt like, one, it was, it was just something that we all kind of identified with, like in different ways. Like you think about rotation, the word, the actual word, and you can like visualize so many different meanings. And that's kind of what we wanted to articulate. Like here we are at Amazon Music. We can do so many different things with different artists. Um, and we have a wheelhouse that we can kind of rotate to amplify whatever it is you're doing. That was the thinking behind developing rotation. And the initial kickoff was like, we wanted to build or bridge that gap between Amazon and our industry partners, our artists friends, our manager friends, our label partners, to let them know like we were here for business um, and we wanted to help the best way we could. We were struggling to, to figure out like what our thing was um, or what our identity was. And then COVID happened and obviously the world is shut down completely. And then our engineer team and our executive teams really flipped in the gear and it was like, yo, 
we're gonna push this agenda on Twitch, which Amazon had acquired in, in Prime Video. And so really leaning on my relationships and my friendships to actually make a dent in this marketplace, I get a call from Chris and Kelly Clancy, and they always are good calls. Chris has a way of not selling anything just from a management standpoint. It's the most like impressive shit as a manager that you can ever like see. He'll call you and he'll say, look, yo, me and T and Kelly, we've been talking through this idea. Let me know what you think. If you don't want it, it's cool. We'll go elsewhere. And, that, and, and, and being on the other side of the phone is like, damn, well, you don't at least want to like, like sell it to me, but it's, it's so amazing because he knows what he has. He has Tyler, the creator, one of the most influential artists in the, in the world. And so we talked through this idea about doing these three shows. And these are the first shows post COVID. Everybody's locked in. Call me if you get lost is just coming out. And Tyler wants to like be in front of his fans, touch the people as he always, as he always does. He doesn't want people on the phones. And so it was like, all right, let's do these shows. Let's partner on these shows. Let's do merch. We're going to do LA. We're going to do um, Texas and we're going to do Brooklyn. And that final show, we had decided to live stream. The live stream team executed the live stream so perfectly that the calls just started coming in. Like people were like, yo, we want to do this next because Tyler had kicked it off for us and him being able to stand next to rotation, stand next to Amazon. That was the stamp that we needed um, to kind of like open the floodgates. Fast forward to late November, Jay Prince announces Free Larry Hoover concert with Kanye and Drake. And obviously like the beef that they have had for a while was, was still brewing. The thought process was like, damn, like who's gonna get that show? My phone rings and I'm just sitting there and there's a guy named Mark Byers. And Mark is talking to me and we're just talking, small talk. And he's telling me like, yo, like I was just at the Coliseum with Benny Siegel and we went to see Kanye. He's like, yeah, I saw Randy Phillips there. And if you remember, Randy Phillips was one of my first partners in this business. He gave my brother and I our first shot. And so I stopped and I'm like, what? What was Randy Phillips doing there? And Mark not knowing what information he's giving me, he's like, yo, Randy is, he's promoting the Kanye and Drake show. So I said, word. <laughs> I hung up the phone for Mark and I called Randy and I'm like, Randy, if you're out here negotiating a, a live stream deal for this damn Kanye and Drake show and you haven't called me, you're dead wrong. And he starts to laugh. I'm like, yo, you know you're supposed to call me. You know you owe me one. And he's like, Tim, let's do it. Like, let's figure it out. And so I called my leadership team um, and everybody's like on board, let's do it. Then the marketing conversation starts to happen. Our PR team starts to do the background on like Larry Hoover and his case and stuff. It's a conversation of like, hey, like, what is this? We thought this was a Kanye and Drake show. So like me, you know, I have to, explain why this is important, why, you know, us partnering with this show is important, um, prison reform and Larry Hoover. And for me, it, it hit home mostly because like I was a kid, my dad spent 17 years of my life in prison. So on my weekends, I spent my weekends at FCI Terminal Island in Long Beach visiting my dad. So it meant more to me um, to be able to get this show off the ground. Steve Boom on my side, Ryan Reddington, Jen Salky, they all like rallied and was like, nah, like this is a good cause. We're actually gonna do this. So like to see that at the 11th hour from, you know, executives at this major corporation was like inspiring. We actually got that through. That show was huge for us. I think one of my most special moments at Amazon um, was being able to partner with Kendrick Lamar and the PG Lane team, Dave Free, Cornell, Aunt, Jared, Jamie on the Big Steppers tour. I think why that was important, the most important for me is like, yo, Kendrick and I are both from, from Compton. The only thing that separates our neighborhood is this canal. So on my side is the blue side, on his side is the red side. The show of unity of like kids growing up in these neighborhoods and being able to do business at that level in Paris. That was my first time I was able to go to Paris and the kid from Compton was the reason why, right? So that shit hit me in a way that nothing else had ever hit me. And it was kind of like a wake up call, like, yo, look where you come from and look where you come from. Look how where you come from got you, got you here. And that's, that's just forever special. So I'll forever think about that moment for sure. Yo, my time at Amazon has been filled with just so many ups, like so many triumphs, just wins that we as a team have collectively put on the board. Me as an executive, I always thought like, you gotta know when to get out the way. Um, you have to know when to 
let the next executive like step in and, and, and run that race. What that meant for me was like, I want to start my own company and launch Free Lunch Agency. The name comes from, you know, just me growing up in, in public school systems. My mom wasn't home, I didn't have money, that free lunch was there to, to help me get through the day. You know, the vision is to just spread my wings and work with other brands um, that, that need help speaking to artists, need help speaking to culture. Um, and I think that I can help and free lunch can help do that in an organic way, an authentic way. I want to partner with people who have a genuine interest in the health, wealth, and ability to affect change in these communities. Those are the people that I want to partner with, and that's what Free Lunch is about. Free Lunch for the youth. Serve Monday through Sunday. Forever.